I want to read to us from John chapter 20. It's quite a long reading. John 20 from 1 through to 18. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and they were both going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And then he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there. And Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know that the scripture that he must rise again from the dead had been fulfilled. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And then they saw weeping. She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabona, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene told the disciples what she had see, that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. <coughs> it's a very real question that Mary asks. Who will roll away the stone? I read that in the reading in Mark. The stone was too heavy for her and she would not be able to roll it away on her own. And then a few thoughts just come to mind. What do you do when you are faced with things that are just too difficult for you to do? Do we have people around us who are able to roll that stone away? And then what do you do when the stone is rolled away? And if you allow me just a little bit of time, I just want to try and explain those three questions. What do we do when we are faced with things that are just too difficult for us to do? Well, there are different ways to face a problem. We can act instinctively and do the first thing that comes to mind. We can act without thinking. We can act impulsively. Well, my friends, then we have to bear the consequences of those actions. Most of us get into a little bit of trouble when we do things at the spur of the moment. We have to realize that if we do, we've got to face the consequence of our actions. 
that one last drink that just pushes you over the edge or that one word that we speak without thinking that just destroys a relationship that one action that harms so many people around us Peter did that Peter was known to be an impulsive person a person who had to open his mouth and change feet all the time he was the one when when they came to to arrest Jesus takes out his sword and he slices off Caiaphas's servant's ear <coughs> and Jesus puts it back and then Peter makes a promise that he can't keep Lord even if I have to die with you and when the purple hits the fan I don't know him <coughs> Jesus and John <coughs> run to the tomb and what does Peter do he just rushes in John stops but Peter just rushes in ready to do whatever I'll never forget going to the garden tomb the first time I went to Israel and everybody was going in and and having a look um, and and sorting out things and and praying and I just stood outside and and the curator of the garden tomb a little American man like this <coughs> tapped me on the shoulder and said he's not here it's okay you can go in I sometimes tend to overthink things. What do you do? We all know the saying, Spate cum alte delight, and uh, that's so true. Well, we can either act impulsively or we can take our time and think things over, make our plans, and, and then act cautiously. The problem is that sometimes we take so long to make a decision that it almost goes past its sell-by date. We mull over it until when we do make that decision, it's too late and all the water is already run under the bridge. <laughs> Nicodemus did that. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the middle of the night. We read it in John 3.16. In John 3, Your Honor. He says to Jesus, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus has this long discussion with him and then says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We don't hear about Nicodemus again until when? Until he helps Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus off the cross and lay him in the tomb. Sometimes we as Christians do that. We, we know God is urging us to do things and to say things and to go places, but, but we tread water. And we miss the opportunity. Did Nicodemus leave it until it was too late? I don't know. The scriptures don't tell us. If he did, what blessings did he miss along the way? Did he miss the chance to, to walk with Jesus, to, to see the miracles, to stand at Lazarus' tomb <coughs> and see Lazarus come out? Did he miss the opportunity to talk with Jesus and to learn from him? These are questions I can't answer. I can only make calculated guesses and my friends that's just as dangerous but what I do know is when God calls me to do something then best I do it best I do it because if I don't God will call somebody else and I will miss the blessing I don't know about you but all I want to do is I want to learn from Jesus I want to live my life in such a way that he would be proud of the way I live. I want to give my all 
before it's too late. Everybody tells me I do too much and I work too hard. Um, I don't think I do. God has given me 24 hours today to fill with as much as I can. Because tomorrow is not promised. Amen. Amen. Tomorrow is not promised. And so I'd rather die with my boots on than die sitting in an armchair uh, waiting for I don't know what. When we have when we have a problem that we need to, to solve, we can ask for guidance and act in the right time. Now now this is perhaps the difficult one. We all know the word push. We need to pray until something happens. Well a man was sleeping one night in his cabin when suddenly his room was filled with a bright light and the Savior appeared in his room and the Lord told the man that he had work for him to do. He showed him a large rock outside his cabin. The Lord explained that that man was to push against that rock with all his might every day. And this the man did day after day. For many years he toiled from sun up to sundown with his shoulders squarely set against this cold, massive surface of an unmoving rock, pushing with all his might. And each night the man returned to his cabin sore and worn out, feeling the whole day had been spent in vain. And seeing that the man was, was starting to show signs of discouragement, uh, Satan decided to enter the picture by placing thoughts into the man's weary mind. You've been pushing against that rock for a long time and it hasn't budged. Why kill yourself over this? You're never going to move it. Thus giving the man the impression that the task was impossible and that he was a failure. <laughs> <coughs> These thoughts discouraged. <laughs> oh, so he says, Good morning, Jesus. <laughs> I Stand together. Father God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you rise in our lives every day. Thank you, Jesus, for the incredible promise that you give to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Are the thoughts that Satan had planted in this man's heart discouraged him? He thought to himself, well, why kill myself over this? He thought, I'll just put in my time giving just one more minimum effort and that'll be good enough. That's just what he planned to do. Until one day he decided to make it a matter of prayer and take his troubled thoughts to the Lord. Lord, he said, I've labored so long and what you've asked yet after all this time I haven't even budged that rock not a millimeter what's wrong why am I failing and the Lord responded compassionately my friend when I asked you to serve me you accepted I told you that your task was to push against the rock with all your strength and you what you've done never once did I mention that I expected you to move it. Your task was just to push. And now you come to me with your strength spent, thinking that you failed. But is that really so? Look at yourself. Your arms are strong and muscular. Your back is sinewy and mighty. Your hands are calloused from the constant pressure and your legs have become massive and hard. It's what you used to have. Yet you haven't moved the rock. But your calling was well, your calling was to be obedient, to push and to exercise your faith and to trust in my wisdom. You've done that, my friend. And now I will move the rock. You see, push stands for pray until something happens. And sometimes we we just want to do everything in one fell swoop. Where God has called us to do one thing and to do it properly. At times when when we hear from God, we tend to use our own intellect. And we try and decipher what he got, what he wants. But you know what? What God actually wants from us is just simple obedience. It's just faith in Him. That it is God who will move that mountain. Pray until something happens. When everything seems to go wrong. Pray until something happens. When the job gets you down, pray until something happens. When people don't react to you the way you think they should, pray until something happens. When your money looks funny and the bills are due, pray until something happens. When people don't understand you, Pray until something happens. <clears throat> the second thing I asked you was, do we have people around us who are able to roll the stone away? Do you feel like you've got no one to help you? No one to walk with you? No one to assist you? We all have people around us. People are around us all the time. But do you have that one person who will really be there for you when your chips are down? If not, then it's such a sad indictment on our church and on the people of the church. Because God has called us to be there for each other. We need to be the Galatians 5 church, bearing one another's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ. Amen. We need to put our hand in the hand of the Lord so that we can, can really walk with Jesus. Amen.
I was listening to a sermon last night, which really made me sit up and think. Enoch was raptured when he walked with the Lord. He didn't die. Elijah didn't die. He was raptured because he walked with Jesus. He walked with the Lord. My friends, are we walking with the Lord? The next important event in the Christian calendar is the rapture. We need to put our hands in the hand of Jesus Amen. and walk with Him. But what do you do when that stone is rolled away? It's a million dollar question. Mary turned and ran back. When she saw that the tomb was open, she didn't go in. She turned and she ran back to go and call the disciples. And Peter and John came running. She couldn't get there quickly enough. I can just imagine her hitching up her skirts and running with her knees coming past her ears like this to get to, to the disciples. I can just imagine her running into that room out of breath, trying to get the words out. He's not there. She told the story. She told the story. Peter and John ran back to the tomb. And then I ask you, when your stone is rolled away, are you prepared to tell the story? God does miraculous things in our lives all the time. But you know what we do? We keep it to ourselves. Instead of going out there and telling the story. And I want to finish with the story. Jeremy was born with a twisted body and a slow mind. At the age of 12, he was still in the second grade, seemingly unable to learn. His teacher, Doris Miller, often became exasperated with him. He would squirm in his seat and drool. He would make grunting noises. At other times he spoke clearly and distinctly, as if a spot of light had penetrated the darkness of his brain. Most of the time, Jeremy just irritated his teacher. <coughs> One day she called his parents in and asked them to come for a consultation. And as the foresters entered the empty classroom, Doris said to them, Jeremy really belongs in a special school. It isn't fair to him to be with younger children who don't have learning problems. There's a five-year gap between his age and the other students. Mrs. Forrester cried softly into a tissue while her husband spoke. Miss Miller, he said, there's no school of that kind nearby. It would be a terrible shock for Jeremy if we had to take him out of this school. We know that he really likes it here. Doris sat for a long time after they left, staring at the snow outside the window. <coughs> its coldness seemed to seep into her soul. She wanted to sympathize with the foresters. After all, their only child had a terminal illness, but it wasn't fair to keep him in her class. She had 18 other youngsters to teach, and Jeremy was a distraction. Furthermore, he would never learn to read and write. Why waste more time trying? As she pondered the situation, guilt washed over her. Here I am complaining when my problems are nothing compared to that poor family, she thought. Lord, please help me to be patient with Jeremy. From that day on, she tried hard to ignore Jeremy's noises and his blank stares. And then one day, he limped to her desk, dragging his bad leg behind him. I love you, Miss Miller. He exclaimed loud enough for the whole class to hear. The other students snickered and Doris's face turned red. 
she stammered. Uh, that, that, that's very nice, Jeremy. Now, now please take your seat. <laughs> Spring came and the children talked excitedly about the coming of Easter. Doris told them the story of Jesus and emphasized the idea of new life springing forth. And she gave each child a large plastic egg. I don't have a plastic egg, but I brought one. Now she said to them, I want you to take this home and bring it back tomorrow with something inside <coughs> that shows new life. Do you understand? Yes, Miss Miller, the children responded enthusiastically, all except Jeremy. He listened intently. His eyes never left her face. He didn't even make his usual noises. Had he understood what she had said about Jesus' death and resurrection? Did he understand the assignment? Perhaps she should call his parents and explain the project to him. That evening, Doris's kitchen sink locked up. She called the landlord and waited an hour for him to come by and unclog it. After that, she still had to stop for groceries, iron a blouse, and prepare a vocabulary test for the next day. She for completely forgot about phoning Jeremy's parents. Next morning, 19 children came to school laughing and talking as they placed their eggs in the large wicker basket on Miss Miller's desk. After they completed their maths lesson, it was time to open the eggs. In the first egg, Doris found a flower. Oh yes, a flower is certainly a sign of new life, she said. When plants peek through the ground, we know that spring is here. Small girl in the front row waved at her. That's my egg, Miss Miller, she called out. The next egg contained a plastic butterfly, which looked really real. Doris held it up. We all know that caterpillars change into beautiful butterflies. Yes, that's new life too. Little Judy smiled proudly and said, Miss Miller, that's my egg. Next, Doris found a rock with moss on it. She explained that moss too showed life and Billy spoke up from the back of the classroom. My daddy helped me, he beamed. And then Doris opened the fourth egg. found it empty. She put it down. She didn't want to embarrass Je Jeremy. She picked up the next. Miss Miller, aren't you going to speak about my egg? Flustered Dor Doris replied, but Jeremy, your egg is empty. He looked at her in the eye and said softly, Yes, but Jesus' tomb was empty too. Time stopped. When she could speak again, Doris asked him, Do you know why the tomb was empty? Oh yes, Jeremy said. Jesus was killed and put in there. Then his father raised him up. The recess bell rang and the children excitedly ran out of the school out to the schoolyard. And Doris cried. The cold inside of her melted away completely. Three months later, Jeremy's died. Those who paid their respects to him at the funeral service placed 19 eggs, empty eggs on his cross. Happy Easter. Let's stand and pray together. <coughs> Father God, help us to remember that the tomb was empty. Help us, Father, to realize that you roll the stone away. 
that you don't expect us to do. And God, help us this Easter to pick up the empty egg. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.